welcome everyone to today's live stream. I'm Michelle Crawford with Michelle Crawford Watercolor and I'm really excited today to uh, share with you a live tutorial on how to paint this realistic ear of corn. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're waiting for uh, lots of people are joining us and I also want to stop and say thank you to everyone from the uh, watercolor for real beginners Facebook group really uh, this uh, tutorials for you and if you like this video and want to see more don't forget to let me know in the comments and subscribe to my YouTube channel with that let's go ahead and get started we're first gonna go over our supplies as you can see here I have uh, my watercolor palette here this is my Windsor & Newton uh, Cotman watercolor palette I do have a couple extra colors um, a couple extra colors here um, in addition but we're only going to use a few of these so I'm going to go ahead and show you our color palette today so we'll be using lemon yellow cadmium yellow cadmium orange yellow ochre sap green hooker's green dark dioxazine purple to darken up our greens and then a little bit of burnt sienna um, at the end to add some of our darker details. Looks like we've got uh, lots of people with us. Hi, Lisa. Nice to see you. Hopefully everyone has um, their supplies ready so we're going to go over everything right now so in addition to our uh, watercolor palette we're also going to make sure that we have our outline if you don't have the outline it's in the description of the video um, i also have a reference image um, i found the original reference image on a free image website Vectezi, and then i've edited it uh, and provided a copy of this so that um, we're all working from the same reference image and then of course there's a line drawing for you as well. We're going to be transferring our line drawing to our watercolor paper. And so for that today, I am painting on a watercolor block. Um, a watercolor block is essentially a pad of watercolor paper and it's glued on all four sides so that you don't necessarily have to tape your paper down. Um, but because of that, I can't necessarily remove my sheet and place it on top of my image and trace it. But if you're painting on a sheet today, um, that's uh, definitely a technique that you can use. Um, but to transfer, uh, transfer the image, I'm actually going to be using some graphite paper. Um, you can also, if you don't have graphite paper but you want to transfer your image the same way, um, you can use your pencil and just rub on the back of the drawing and then when we do the transferring, it'll go through as well. So a few different options for that. Um, you can either use a styling or a pencil to trace that, or I use this stylus. It's just a, a small little dot stylus. It makes it um, easy to, to transfer. And then I'll also use the stylus today to apply a bit of masking fluid. So with this painting today, I'll grab the example here. Um, as you can see, we've got all these little white highlights on each little kernel of corn. And if we were going to paint around the white of our paper, um, that would make this a very tedious project. But if you have some masking fluid, what I've, I'll be using this little tool to just uh, apply a dot onto each little kernel of corn. And this really adds to the realism of this painting. So make sure you have some masking fluid with you. And then I've also got uh, an eraser, some tape, even though I don't have to tape my paper down, I do like to have this nice white edge around it. And so I will use some tape. Um, and of course, a couple jars of clean water, my watercolor brushes, and I've got a variety of brushes here today. Um, some, I've got one flat brush. This is a Princeton Heritage brush. And then I have um, several of my Craftmo brushes, both their bamboo brushes. Um, these are just round brushes in various sizes. I also have um, the Emma Lafave set of these. Um, if you are new to watercolor and you wanna learn, especially like florals or just a lot of beginner tutorials, Emma Lafave is great and she um, recently launched these brushes, which I really like. Um, so we've got a few brushes here. Uh, I've got a cloth here to dab my brush. You can always use a paper towel. And then I've also got a spray bottle. We're gonna be doing a nice um, kind of wash background behind our corn and the spray bottle is really going to help with that 
if you don't have one, it's it's not a necessity, but um, nice to have. Another thing that's also going to be nice to have since we're doing a live tutorial is a either a hair dryer or some type of heat tool. I've got this heat tool here, um, and this is just going to help us um, dry in between layers so that we can um, keep going and try to make uh, this painting in as little bit of time as possible. All right, so before we jump into our first step, I want to see if um, anyone on the, the live has any questions. Happy to answer before we jump right in. I don't see any questions right now. Okay. Well, our first step, as I mentioned, we're going to uh, transfer our image. And before I use the graphite paper, graphite paper can get a little bit messy, so uh, we will take a break and wash our hands right after we transfer the image. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and put my border tape around. So I am using this Holbein soft tape. I found this through Let's Make Art, and I really like the tape. Um, I've tried a variety of different tapes. Um, painter tapes and this one seems for me um, to work really well as far as like not having any color bleed through but also it doesn't rip the paper when I remove it um, and so some tapes I've noticed do that more than others and that can be really frustrating so I'm just got this I think it's like a quarter inch and putting this on all four edges of my sheet of paper if you're not using a block today, if you're using a sheet of watercolor paper and you're you're gonna wanna still tape your paper down to some type of a surface, um, some type of a board, uh, so that it's not going to warp and move as we paint. Again, just making sure I have that clean border on all four sides. I like to wrap the tape around the back of my block just so it doesn't get in the way while I'm painting. All right, there's our last piece. So when we remove this, it'll give us that really nice crisp edge on our painting. So now we are going to transfer our image. And so I have my line drawing here. I've printed it out. I've also already trimmed it to the size of my paper. And I left a little bit of um, an edge to just trimmed off a little excess at the top just so that I could tape this down um, so it doesn't move. So you wanna make sure that your image does not move at all while you are transferring because uh, once it does, it's nearly impossible to get it back into the same place. So for that reason, I like to put some tape across the top and you know, we'll be lifting it up and checking. And so um, just to be safe, I also like to put a little bit of tape over the corner. And this tape I'm using is um, some 3M delicate surface tape. Um, I'm just using this because I don't wanna waste all of my good whole fine tape. Um, I really like that tape, but this is what I used Previous to that, it also does a, a pretty decent job because it's this delicate surface. Again, when you remove it, it doesn't really um, risk ripping your paper. So I've got that on here. And then I've got a sheet of graphite paper. So um, before, well, as I'm laying this down, you wanna be able to take a sheet of graphite paper, you're gonna put a graphite side down in between your paper and the image here and then be careful here because anywhere that you press down is going to transfer the graphite to the paper. Also I mentioned this is graphite paper and not carbon paper. If you want to use carbon paper that's fine but just know that carbon paper or any, um, this paper is also wax free, even graphite paper that has wax in it will be a little bit more permanent and a little harder to remove. So Lisa says that um, she's going to have to freehand hers. You know, I think that that's great. And Lisa is one of those people I've seen. She's done a lot of like ink drawings and she is a fantastic artist. I happen to be um, someone who loves to paint. I have a background in graphic design, so computer aided design. Um, and that's how I do a lot of my outlines. Um, but 
I've never really been able to draw freehand. And so if you're like me and sometimes you just want to get to painting, um, then this is a great way to do that. But, you know, if you're feeling comfortable with drawing, that is also awesome. <laughs> And so I'm just kind of, I, I try to make this pretty simple. We want to make sure that we're able to see each little kernel of corn. And you can see as I've been pressing down, it's coming through the paper here. And so each little kernel, um, it's going to be important that we can separate those. Um, we're going to, again, make this really realistic looking, but we're going to do it in kind of a simple way by using... Um, shading the contrast between light and dark is what's really going to make this corn stand out so i'm not even being too precise i'm just trying to make sure that i have um, all these lines transferred there are a lot of them so this might take us a little bit of time but that's all right while we're going through this happy to answer any questions you might have in the chat or any questions you might have about supplies. Al Hamport says she's going to make hers without the background. That's also a, a great option. I struggled with backgrounds when I first started painting with watercolor. And I really haven't been painting for very long. It's been uh, two, two and a half years maybe. Um, it's something that I just kind of got into. Um, but the backgrounds adding backgrounds to your your paintings is not always necessary um, but in this case i'm going to show you how to do a nice soft background um, and oh, the way that we're going to do this um, you're not going to get a lot of hard edges around your corn so i think a lot of people um, struggle when they're painting backgrounds after they've painted the subject we're actually going to paint our background first and paint the subject on top so um, However you want to uh, approach this, it's your painting. I'm just here to share what I've learned. So you're just kind of checking, make sure I see what I've transferred and going back in. And you know, art really is for everyone. As I mentioned, I took a few art classes in high school, never really been a great like freehand drawer. I think I was always kind of interested in art, but it wasn't until just a couple years ago, late in my adult life, that I really got into watercolor painting. But anyone really can do this. It just takes a little bit of patience and uh, time. So I may not be the world's greatest artist, but, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time learning about watercolor and, you know, I've been that fresh beginner trying to research different topics to improve my art or to learn how how to do some of the things I'm going to show you today. So I'm really just here to, to teach you what I know. Um, that's something I can do, um, even though I may not be the best artist. Some things turn out fantastic. Some days I feel my art's not great, but honestly, that's kind of the creative process, right? Um, when you feel inspired to paint. And for me, it's being inspired by what I'm painting, but also, you know, bringing in the right headspace, being in the right mood to be creative. So um, we have somebody saying that the graphite image is not really visible in the video. So it's probably going to be a little bit difficult for you all to see my transfer because this is pretty light. And after we transfer, we also kind of lighten it up. I'll try to show it a little bit closer here in better light oh it's um kind of washed out but if i tilt it here so you can kind of see it's very very light um just because of the video it's a little bit hard for you to see um maybe next time i'll use some uh carbon paper to make it a little bit easier for you to see but it's it doesn't have to be perfect we are going to lighten it up a little bit um, unless you want to see the pencil through your watercolor that's you know always acceptable in watercolor um, so i've got most of those kernels just going back through i think i have this last little row to do is the image copyrighted so 
So I found this image on vecteasy.com. It's a free image website. So if you are looking for free images, there's a lot of places you can find them. I really like Vecteasy um, as well as Pixabay. Um, but as I mentioned, I, um, I'm a graphic designer and so Vecteasy is a site I use a lot. Um, I do have a pro account there, so um, I'm not sure if this image is available for everyone, but it is, um, oh, I just realized I didn't have my paper under here. Um, so even though the image was provided by them, um, I have also edited the image, so I have permission to use it, and um, I've made changes uh, just so that we have this nice line art, which I created from the image. Can you link those down below the video? Yeah, if you look in the description, there is a link to the Pixabay reference photo. There's also a link to download that the edited version that I created, as well as this pencil outline. This task does take a little bit, but I promise you once we get painting, uh, you'll be surprised at how quick it is to paint this ear of corn. Make sure I didn't miss any kernels up there. And there are times when I do draw the image. Um, it just kind of depends on how much time I have and how antsy I am to get painting. <laughs> but honestly, even art and drawing, I know people think you're either born with creativity or the artistic gene or you're not, but I really don't believe that that's true. And I remember very clearly, I was in a high school art class and on the first day of class, the teacher asked us all to draw, and it may have even been like the first few days, to draw a still life. She had all these objects sitting out, and we were just to kind of create a scene, create a still life scene, and then draw it, and we put them up on the board, and I gotta tell you, everyone's was quite atrocious. <laughs> then, um, we spent a few weeks learning about art, learning about balance, learning about shading, learning about perspective. And, you know, just within a few weeks, we, we learned some basic information and then we did the assignment again and hung them up right next to the ones that we had done that first week. And it was amazing the difference between them and everyone's turned out really really well everyone looked like it was done by an artist I mean so just like anything art takes practice patience and time Lisa Bryant was wondering if there's any other purple she might use so really for the purple we're only going to use that to darken up some of our green so if you have any type of blue and the reason why I'm using purple you tend to, if you want to neutralize a color, you go to the opposite of the color wheel. Um, so if you're not familiar with color theory, I do have a, a video that explains it um, pretty well. But essentially, if you have a color like green and you want to kind of darken that color or neutralize it, you'll end up, if you mix equal parts of green and red, since they're opposite, you'll get black or brown. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm adding a, a Kind of purple violet color um, dioxazine purple i'll show you is kind of right in between like a, a, a violet and a red so i'm just taking it partially over the color wheel um, by using a purple instead of a red i'm just going to kind of darken that color and not really neutralize it completely again color theory is uh, can feel a little bit complex or overwhelming but We've got a pretty simple video about it if you want to check it out um, and if you you know would love to see more content about color theory color mixing um, let me know in the comments as well I'm almost done here 
maybe let me know where you're at if you're painting along with us. Put the stem here. I think I've got most of my image. So I think now you can see that a little bit more on screen. Um, once you're finished with this step, you're probably gonna have a little bit of graphite on your hand. So like really before you touch anything, what I like to do, and you can reuse these sheets of graphite paper. I reuse them many, many times. I kind of fold it in on itself so it's not going to transfer to wherever I store it. And then this is a good time to take a quick break, wash your hands, and then come back before we start to remove it so you don't get any excessive graphite on your paper. So I'm gonna go wash my hands really quick and give everyone a little bit of time to catch up on the tracing. Right, my hands are now nice and clean. Also, when I'm painting, I almost always have a nice cup of coffee. Make it's not sure it's not your near your paint water. <laughs> if you've been in any of the watercolor groups long enough, you've probably seen lots of videos of people or lots of content of people accidentally mistaking their their coffee for paint water. We also have cats they also like to watercolor paint as well all right so now that my hands are clean i'm going to remove my transferred image careful not to remove the tape that i put down already okay. all right so now I do want to lighten it up a little bit there. It's darker in a few areas, but you also notice that even though I was really careful, I still have a little a few smudges um, from just pressing through the paper. Um, so this is where your eraser comes in handy. And I really like to use a kneaded eraser. Any eraser will, really, will do, but what I like about a kneaded eraser is it's malleable. It's kind of like clay. You can see I'm able to, to mold it. Um, but because of that, it, once it gets dirty, you can just kind of like rework it and it will be clean and ready to use again. And the way I tend to use this is you're, you're able to just kind of blot up on the paper. Since it's malleable, some people roll it on their paper, um, but you can pick up any of that excess graphite. And then I usually lighten up my image a little bit. I won't try not to lighten it too much so that you guys are still able to see my transferred, but I do want to make sure that I'm getting any of that excessive like graphite dust removed from my. And you can see it, it was dirty, so I'm just going to do a little bit of molding and right back to erasing. All right, I think that's pretty good for me. And then our next step is going to be applying the masking fluid. So if you want to get your masking fluid ready, and then you'll also want to have the reference image handy as well. So we can see where the highlights, I didn't mark them on the line drawing. Um, we're going to use our reference image to help with that. <clears throat> so here's our reference image and if I actually zoom in a little bit you can see on each of these kernels there's a tiny white highlight on each one and in the example painting you see that as well 
And those little white highlights are just little dots of masking fluid. And so this is where my uh, little stylus tool comes in really handy. It's just got a little ball point on the end. And so I'm able to just kind of like dot that on each of these. And there's all different types of masking fluid. I seem to really like this PBO drawing gum. Um, so this is what I'm gonna be using today. And so there's two sizes on here. I've got kind of a larger one and a smaller one. I'm just gonna move my paints out of the way for a moment so I can put my reference photo side by side. There we go. And so again, I just wanna put a little dot right there on uh, each little kernel of corn right where I see it in this photo. So it's kind of in the bottom left of each little kernel. And this doesn't have to be perfect, but it is gonna help us kind of give the illusion that this is more realistic. So I'm just dipping it in there. Then I see one here, one here. You can see it's, it's really quick and easy to apply with this stylus. There, there. dot. This will really add that extra detail without having to, you know, use your detail brush to paint around all these little highlights. We will want this to dry, this masking fluid to dry completely before we paint over this. Um, and I will say this is the one time you don't want to use your heat tool. Um, if you use the heat tool and the masking fluid, it tends to stick a little bit more to the paper and it'll be a little bit harder to remove. And so um, I try to be pretty careful with my heat tool when I'm using masking fluid. Just keep dipping it back in and get a couple little dabs out of it. And if you get a big blob, just let it dry. You can peel it right off and uh, do it again. But you wanna wait till it dries completely before you do try to peel it off. Otherwise, you'll make a bit of a mess. Get that row. I think most of the people joining us today are from uh, the Watercolor for Real Beginners Facebook group. We've been growing a lot lately. Uh, it seems like maybe lots of people got paint for Christmas <laughs> after New Year's. It's been, um, I think we've nearly doubled in size. We're over 300 members, so that's really exciting. Again, I started that group because you know, I spent a lot of time trying to learn all the different things I could about watercolor. And I was part of a lot of groups. Um, some of the groups are more friendly than others. And so um, I wanted to have a place for people that are just starting out. They're really beginning with watercolor. Um, I don't want anyone to feel intimidated. My goal is to, again, teach you what I've learned so that um, your art journey can, can be a little bit easier and you know, there's all kinds of beginners. <laughs> Some people have been painting for or doing different types of art for a while. Some people have never uh, used any other type of medium and all that's okay. Again, I did a little bit of, took a few art classes in high school. I think we painted with oil um, and some ceramics, but not until I was 35 years old one day I just decided mm, I might try watercolor <laughs> and I haven't stopped since I do actually have a grandfather who was a fairly famous watercolor artist and he passed away when I was very young I I do remember him well I have a lot of his artwork but I kind of wish that you know if there were one person that I could that's passed away that I could just kind of sit and talk with, it would probably be him. <laughs> I 
I would have so many questions for him. All right. This is probably the most tedious part of the process. And I honestly used to like struggle with masking fluid and I don't use it very often, but I really felt it was perfect for this project to make all these little highlights on the corn kernels. Curious to know, people in the chat, how long have you been uh, trying watercolor? Have you um, tried other mediums? What's your experience level with watercolor? little ones over here some of them don't have highlights I'm just kind of trying to make sure some of them do all right I think I have all my highlights dabbed on now um, another nice thing about using this tool is it's really easy to clean up so I tend to if you're using a brush um, you want to make sure that you get the masking fluid off pretty quickly before um, could potentially ruin your brush, but with this stylus tool, I can just kind of wipe it right off and it comes right off of there, I'm ready to use again. Good comment, Lisa, about using a purple with only one pigment. Um, anytime you introduce other colors so say if you're mixing a red with a green if you mix a green that's on the yellow side you're going to be introducing yellow into the mix and so you're going to get some type of a brown so lisa's right to use a, a kind of a pure purple and then that way you won't have any other pigments um, kind of muddying up the mix but we won't use too much of the purple it's really just to give us the darkest value to do our final um, details on the corn husk All right, so we want this masking fluid to dry. It's gonna take a couple minutes. So now's a good time for any questions. We may be able to paint our background while it's still drying, but we'll give it a couple more minutes. Make sure to put your lid on your masking fluid or that will go bad very quickly. All right. So I mentioned I have a wash brush. I'm gonna be using this in the next step to wet up our background. We're gonna be doing a nice wet and wet background. And um, we're gonna be using the same colors for our background that are in the subject itself. So. We're gonna be using yellows and greens and let them kind of blend. And this is just gonna give a lot of harmony to the background. Um, but we also wanna make sure it's light enough that there's contrast so that the, the subject like stands out from the background. So we're actually going to be starting um, by painting all the way around the yellow part of the corn. We're gonna include the, the leaves and, or the husk of the corn as we start our background just to kind of um, create a type of underpainting. An underpainting for watercolor is really just kind of like laying down some color initially so that you can get an idea of what it's gonna look like. <laughs> um, and the, but we're gonna wash most of that out into the background. That sounds complicated, don't worry. We're gonna make it really simple. All right, so try to be careful not to disturb the masking fluid. I think as this dries, I'm gonna go ahead and start um, with the background. So I'm gonna take some clean water and I have two jars of water here. Um, I'll try to keep one as clean water and one as dirty water. 
um, just because there will be times where we're adding, we'll want to add clean water to our painting. So I'm going to go ahead and wet my brush and then start wetting up the entire background. And I'm going to paint right up to the yellow kernels and I'm going to include the husk. So just wet the whole thing. The idea here is that your paper should get damp. And I should also talk about the importance here of using cotton watercolor paper. So the best type of paper to use for watercolor is 100% cotton, 140 pound thickness. There's all types of different brands out there. Um, you don't have to use arches. I, I do love arches, we all do. <laughs> but um, you don't have to use that. I'm using um, Bao Hong paper right now. This is actually a brand that was recommended to me by some other artists. Um, it is 100% cotton. I was able to purchase it on Amazon and it was pretty um, affordable compared to, you know, arches. Um, but having 100% cotton watercolor paper is going to help um, with your wet and wet. It, you want the water to kind of absorb into the paper so it stays damp. Um, otherwise, if your paper is drying too quickly, um, if you're using a synthetic fiber or um, non-cotton watercolor paper, um, it's probably going to dry a little bit quicker and it might be a little bit more difficult to do some of the wet on wet techniques. So again, just painting clean water all the way around the yellow kernels or what will be yellow kernels. They're just kind of white now. But. And then we want to add enough water that we don't have, you know, pools of water, but there's definitely a sheen to it. You don't want any areas drying, so make sure it's equally wet. And <clears throat> we're going to be dropping in color and to create the soft background. And the reason why we put the water down first, one is so that the paint can flow, but we're stopping around this corn. So an important part of watercolor is water <laughs> and the paint is only going to flow where there is water. So where there isn't, it's going to create a barrier and we're going to be able to get this nice kind of outline around this corn without having to worry about getting paint where we don't want it. Okay, so now that my paper is nice and thoroughly wet, you can see that I have a sheen on my paper. Um, now I'm gonna go into some of my colors. So for this background, we're gonna kind of just start laying in some of the green around here and then try to spread it out a bit. So we're gonna start with some sap green. Um, so I'm gonna go right here on my palette, grab my sap green, and we'll actually zoom in a little bit here so you can see it a little bit more clearly. And with your paints, I do like to wet them up beforehand. So I've got a spray bottle here. I'm just gonna kind of wet them up, the ones we're gonna be using. I also like to wet up my palette a little bit. This just helps activate the paints. And so I think as a beginner, one of the hardest things is also understanding balance between water and paint, how much paint to use. Well, really you should start with a puddle in there. And if you were to use this straight out of the pan, that would be nice pure saturation. Um, if you want to water down the color, I recommend doing it on your palette. Um, but I think what we tend to do as artists is, you know, when you dip your brush in the water and then you go in here, you a lot of times will go in with too much water and it's either really light or it's not flowing the way you want. So one of the things I always like to do is when I go to wash off my brush, I always dip or tap it on here. And then even sometimes if I need a, a, to get some, rid of some of the water, I'll tap it on my, on my paper towel. But I'm taking paint straight from here, adding a little bit of water. And you can see it also needs to move around on the palette. Hopefully you can kind of see that. And now I'm going straight from the palette to my paper. I'm not gonna add any additional water. And I'm just gonna kind of start to lay that around where these corn husks are. You can see I had some drying happen right here and I got a little bit sloppy. If you make any mistakes, um, you can always quickly blot it up if it's still wet and you won't even be able to tell. But if you have any areas that do start to dry, just go ahead and add some more water. And 
You can see I'm just painting right up to that corn and it should flow around. We're gonna spray this and get some more flowing. So grab some more of that green, kind of lay it in there. And then at this point, we're gonna add the yellow. So for the back room, we still wanna keep it again nice and light. So we're gonna go for the lemon yellow. I'm gonna put some on my palette here. You can see it's a very bright yellow compared to um, the cadmium, which is uh, got a little red in it, so it's a little bit more orange. It's much more the color of corn that we're thinking of. But this background we want to be nice and light, so we're gonna use mostly that lemon yellow, add in maybe a tiny bit of the cadmium, so we get this kind of mix. You can mix it up on your palette. And then we're going straight in here. You can. Drop it with your brush. You can add a little bit more water and like splatter it, but essentially what we're doing here is just kind of trying to add, pay, add pigment. And we're gonna use our spray bottle to make this a little bit more random and we're gonna blend it. It's just gonna be a nice wash of a background. So you can see, add some more here. And once I feel that there's enough paint, I'm going to grab my spray bottle and if you hold it far enough far away and spray you're going to get this kind of pattern where you see like the little dots of paint showing a little white dot and that'll start to spread things around. Um, you could also depending on how creative you want to be take some clean water and just drop it onto your wet background. You can see it's going to make some interesting blooms. Um, you could use salt at this point. It's really um, completely up to you. Um, what does salt do? The salt would give it kind of a grainy texture. Um, and with salt, you kind of want to wait till everything's kind of at the damp stage, not totally wet, and then put it on, and then you got to wait for it to dry. Um, what I'm going to do here is also kind of move around my paper to move around the pigments. So as I'm moving it around, I'm going to spray and just kind of tilt it different directions, and that pigment will start to mix and move and you'll get a very interesting abstract light background. So which yellow are you starting with? I used the lemon yellow and I added just a small amount of cadmium yellow to it to make it a little bit um, closer to the color of the corn but this is going to dry a lot lighter than it is right now um, and so we want to make sure again that we have a really light background so that the subject's going to kind of pop off the page. And if our masking fluid was dry when we started, we could have painted the corn as well, just with the light uh, yellow. Um, but I wanted to give a little bit of time for that to dry. And now I'm going to use my heat tool and start to dry my background so that we can move on um, to the next step. I'm going to try to be careful not to get too much of the heat on my masking fluid because, again, it can help... Uh, make it more difficult to remove. And then also before I start drawing, I want to make sure I don't have any issues on my edges. Now I'm just going to let this dry. If you have a hair dryer, you could use that. You would want to put it on a low setting. Um, this heat tool is hot, but it doesn't have a lot of forceful air coming out. It, um, that will move your pigment around. I just want to try to speed up the drying process. What would happen if it wasn't all drying? So if it's not completely dry and we start to go in and paint the corn, we're going to, you know, have our paint mixing um, and our next step is going to be wet on dry <laughs> and in order to do that we need to have our, our paper completely dry. So as you do layers, if you notice that you try to go in and add a layer and you're messing up what you did before, you, you probably want to make sure that things are completely dry before you move, move on. Um, otherwise you're going to get um, blooms and blends and bleeds and stuff in places where you probably don't want them. And you'll know it's completely dry when kind of your paper loses its wrinkles <laughs> if it got a little bit warped while we were wet on wet. 
but after a while you'll be able to just kind of feel it with your hand. And I'm also wiping any excess moisture from my tape here. to be completely dry. Starting to get almost dry. Takes a lot of patience. Watercolor does take patience. <laughs> no, I'm not the most patient person. I think watercolor's probably been really good for me for that reason. <laughs> Heat tools are also really helpful. I'm trying to avoid as much of that as well. The heat tool is also handy for removing tape, so if you do notice that your tape tends to rip your paper when you remove it at the end, which can be totally frustrating once you've finally finished a painting that you really love. Um, if you heat up your tape with your heating heat tool, it'll actually be a little bit easier to remove. Where would you find a heat tool at? So you can uh, go on Amazon. This is the one that, uh, it's called the Heat It Craft Tool. It was recommended by Let's Make Art. Again, if you don't know letsmakeart.com, check it out. Uh, they've got watercolor subscription box um, you don't have to subscribe to it though because they post all their tutorials online every week there's a new tutorial so that was one company that really helped me get into watercolor um, but you can go on Amazon just put like a heat craft tool and um, there's all kinds of different ones they're not that expensive but again if you have a hair dryer that's always a great backup as well okay Mine is dry. We're going to be moving on now to the corn. Um, I think what we'll do now first is now that this is dry, let's go ahead and paint in our corn husk. Um, we're going to be using that same green mixture. We're just going to uh, paint our first wash um, of the green husk so that we can start to see the, the subject pop up out of the background. So I've got uh, a number eight round brush here. You can use a smaller brush if you'd like, but no real detail here. We're just going to go around your outline um, and paint that in. If you can't see your outline anymore because you did the wash, you can always you know, use a pencil and draw some of it back in. Or you can always just kind of improvise and uh, put it back in if if that happens to you. So I'm going to go ahead and take the green. Again, this is sap green, um, which is going to be our lightest value. So now that we're on our subject, with watercolor, um, one of the things that makes it different than most other painting mediums is that because watercolor is transparent, um, you can't necessarily paint a darker color on top of a lighter color. So when we're approaching our painting, we really need to think through um, the order of how we are going to build up the color. So the lightest color in this corn husk is the color I'm painting right now. And I'm going to paint the whole thing that color and then the additional darker values we're going to be adding in um, with a detail brush. So our first wash is just going to be one flat wash. And I like to rotate my paper often. You can see now that we're doing wet on dry, the paint is staying exactly where we put it. It's not moving around like it was. And if you want to get a nice flat wash, never go over what the paint that you've already put down. You just want to kind of keep adding to it and let it sit and dry and you'll get a nice flat wash. If you kind of go back in and try to move it around, um, you're going to get um, some brush strokes. Things aren't going to be equally as wet. And um, if you're looking for that technique or that type of effect, that's great. But in this case, I want a nice even wash. 
You can see even this has started to dry a little bit faster than this. If that happens, you just kind of add a little bit of water to your brush and re-wet the whole area. If it dries, and then that should keep everything flowing nicely. Again, try not to like, see I'm going back over this wash just to wet and everything. And I'm also trying not to add too much additional water so that we don't get that um, kind of bleed back happening. Okay. There's all kinds of different brush holes and things like that, but honestly, I just hold my brush the way best works for me. Lisa Bright says she doesn't have the heat tool, so I think the hair dryer would work for that. Oh yeah, hair dryer's great. Or you just wait for it to dry. You can always pause, come back to the live. If you need to take a break to dry it. So now I've got that side filled in. I'm gonna move over here to the stem. I think it's called a stem on a ear of corn. Stock. The stock. And then again, when I need more paint, I'm not gonna go back into my water. I'm just gonna go right to my palette because I've already mixed it up there. If I go into my water, I'm gonna change the consistency of my paint. Some of it's gonna be more wet than others and I'm not gonna get a nice even wash and I'm, I think that's really important when you're trying to learn about water paint ratio I'm just going right up to the edge of the corn there You can see now this is starting to pop off the page since we have the contrast um, but that background is really nice and complimentary and it's gonna really look nice with this piece of corn I went over my line there I always like to keep these little pieces of, of paper towel handy because once again your paint is still wet you can just blot it right up miss my line a little bit here so I'm gonna go back into my paint Okay, so we'll recreate the, this. Went to Google. The main parts of the corn cob is the husk, the silk, the kernels, and the cob. The husk, the silk, the kernels, and the cob. I think we'll call it the cob. Okay. And there will be parts that are darker or lighter. You can see I just made that a little bit darker than some of the other parts. You can either try to blend that up. I'm just, when you blend colors, I've got like just a really, really light pressure. Like my brush is barely touching and I'm just trying to move that pigment around so that it's a little bit more even. And now that part we can dry. I will dry lighter. Got a little bit of water on my corn here. I'm just going to block that up. And if your background wasn't completely dry, you're probably going to get a little bit of bleeding on the edge. Um, you can always clean that up later. But it's important to make sure everything is dry before moving on to the next step. So now we're going to move over to these corn kernels. I'm going to pull up my example here. And so you, you can see on this corn that we have the highlight and then there's a really light value and it kind of transitions from that highlight to a light, a little bit medium value, and then there's a darker value kind of 
in between the corn kernels. Um, that's sh showing us where like the shadow would be. So we're gonna do this um, with a wet on wet technique and we're not gonna like let everything completely dry before we add paint, but this is gonna be a great exercise in a water control as well. So our first step, we've already got the masking fluid in, which is gonna be that, that white value here. So we wanna go in with our lightest value, which is just gonna be a really light yellow. So really the same wash that we used in the background is gonna be our first wash for the corn. So we've got, again, some of the lemon yellow with a little bit of cadmium, and we're gonna um, water it down a bit so that we get our lightest value. And you just paint all over the entire ear of corn. Fill it all in. And we want this to stay wet, so since we're doing a really light value, if um, it starts to dry on you at all, you can always um, just go back and dip a little bit of water on your brush and keep moving pigment around, keep things nice and evenly wet. This doesn't have to be very detailed at this point. We just wanna make sure that we get this wash all the way around the ear of corn. So this is our second lightest value next to the highlight. Again, stay evenly wet. You can add some pigment like I just did and then grab more water and just move it around. I mentioned we're gonna be doing wet on wet and it's kind of like we're gonna be painting in between the rows of kernels. So we don't want this to dry completely, but we do want it to kind of seep in a little bit so that when we add the next color, it's not gonna bleed completely. And we're also gonna switch to probably a smaller brush. So I'm going to grab my size four. Actually, again, if we look at our reference or the example, we have the lightest value on the left side of the kernel and it's getting darker. So we have all these uh, light areas. What we're gonna do now is just start to add in some color, but we're just gonna kind of go row by row and try to drop that in on the right side of the highlights. And again, this doesn't have to be perfect. And we're gonna add a little bit more cadmium to this mix. So it starts to be a little bit more the color of the corn. Um, and I'm using a smaller brush, uh, one, because I'm going to be getting in between these kernels, but also this brush will hold less water and I'll get less, um, you want to make sure you have a little bit more control. So taking this mix and I'm going to start just kind of top of this row and just going to drop it in to the right of all my highlights. Just in a vertical line, just like that. I've got kind of all these ones up top that in a different shape, so I'll just kind of put it to the right of the highlights over there and go to the next row. Just going vertically straight down. We're going to separate the kernels later to give the extra detail, so this is really just trying to get that variation of color. Super subtle, but it's gonna make a big difference in the end. Then the darkest part of our ear of corn is actually, our light source is kind of coming from the left. And so the darkest part is where the corn is going underneath the husk over here. And we'll also have like, you know, natural shadows um, on both sides of that. But for that reason, we're gonna go ahead and take that down all the way to the right side of this too. That way we're, that area will appear darker and it'll, feel like that shadow is a little more natural. Okay. And we're just going to let this again kind of dry a little bit in between these layers. We're going to, as this is setting, grab some more cadmium orange, add that to your mix, or sorry, cadmium yellow and add that to your mix. So we're going to get mostly cadmium yellow in this next one, and then we'll start to add a little bit of the cadmium orange. Same thing, you're, you're, and you wanna be 
maybe a little bit further away from the highlight this time. Just start adding straight down. And I do have a spot right here that for me is a little bit dry. So I just kind of wet my brush and went back in. That'll be fine. Again, more paint. Going down the right side of those curls. Same thing on all the ones up here. Just a little dab. And again, you want to make sure that we've got that also right next to the husk on both sides. If it doesn't look like you've got enough um, contrast, you can always add more. Or if you put too much paint in an area, you can always blot. You can see if you blot wet watercolor, it will soak right up and create more highlights. Um, but you could also, again, just let it sit a little bit longer, get a little bit more dry, and then add some more of this cadmium yellow. This is just gonna create the illusion that these are round kernels of corn. Okay. Let that set. And we're gonna grab a little bit of cadmium orange, not too much, um, just a small amount, mix that in, and we should get another slightly darker value. We're gonna let this sit a little bit longer this time because we're gonna start to add this <clears throat> where these kernels separate. So kind of where the line is in between the kernels is where we're gonna start to add this. And as this dries, it'll eventually get drier and drier. We'll start to add in more details. So um, everywhere where you've essentially drawn a, a line, you want to um, try to drop some of this orange. Again, still working vertically. You can see now that it's drier, we're on the right side of the kernel, that um, this is a little bit more obvious, the color we're putting in. But since everything is still wet, it should sit and blend as we work. Just on the right side. And then the ones up top, I'm kind of like doing the right, again, following that line and making it roundish. And then we'll go down our Sides where we're meeting up with the husk. Must be a little bit darker probably right here at the base. So we'll put some extra paint there. And you can kind of move it around if you're not getting as much movement as you would like. Okay. And now we're going to grab a detail brush. I have a size zero. If you have um, a size zero or smaller, I also have uh, a tr triple zero. I hope I won't need that one, but um, we're gonna use this to put in some of the darkers. And actually, smaller brush isn't gonna hold as so much water, but. All right, so we're gonna, add, now with our mixture, we're gonna go over here to our yellow ochre. Mine's a little bit dry now. I'm gonna spray that down a little bit more to activate it. Okay, I'm gonna start a little puddle of yellow ochre around here. The yellow ochre is gonna be essentially the darkest color in our corn. And we also have, um, I mentioned that we might be using a little bit of burnt umber, um, sorry, burnt sienna, which is just right next to my yellow ochre. I'm gonna put a little bit there. That's just if we need a little a little more darkness, a little more contrast with our, with our yellow ochre. So I have taken the yellow ochre right onto my palette I'm using a small brush um, and I'm not adding, like going into my water. I want this to be more detailed, but I might just tap it on my towel here so that 
I know I don't have excess water. Now we're going to start going right in between those kernels with your detail brush, following the line with this full strength of yellow ochre. And we're like close to dry, but not 100%. It doesn't have to be perfect either. Even though this is, looks pretty realistic, I would say that this is still an impressionistic painting. It, it's not photorealism. Um, we just want to insinuate that this is corn. See, some areas are, are drier than others, and so I'm getting a sharper brush stroke. I really like that look, so that variation is going to give your painting some interest. And then I'm going to make sure that I put this in that dark side as well, because that's going to be the darkest area of our corn. If you do go over your green a little bit, again, you could blot it up, but we're going to do some more layers on the corn husk. So no worries there. And then you can add a little bit of that anywhere you see a line with the pieces of, or kernels of corn on the top. Just that darker side. If it doesn't blend as well as you want it to, you can always just add a little bit of water. If you add some clean water and just kind of spread it around, get a nice effect here. Okay. <clears throat> Not quite looking like corn. I think it really doesn't look like corn until we take off the masking fluid. But now we're gonna take this, this brush again and we're just gonna try to separate each of these little kernels. And so again, hopefully you can see your lines. If not, just kind of put them where you think they should go. But really, really, it's almost like you're doing a, a little curve. I'm just kind of going kernel by kernel, putting in a little line in between each of our little highlights to simulate the, the kernels here. And this is because you would have shadow in this area in between the kernels. You can water your paint down a little bit if you want to add some variation. Even this is wet on wet, we're using a very um, thick wash on top of a not so wet background so we want to get a little bit of blending but it still should have some definition. And I'm not even being super precise here. I'm just kind of trying to make sure there's a curve to each little line. It's great about painting like plants and food and <laughs> anything that comes from nature is none of it's perfect, right? So those imperfections should also show up in our art. We're going to be depicting what it really is. Now I got a couple uh, area here that was really light and dry, so I've just kind of mixed the colors a little bit and I can blot it to lift a little bit of that up, but I feel like that's a little bit better. If you have areas that aren't blending as well, adding a little bit of water like right here, I think I could just do a little bit of blending. Now your tiny little brush isn't going to hold as much water as a big brush. So keep that in mind that I can just add a little bit of water and kind of blend that a little bit and create some shading for each little kernel. Same thing with these little lines. When I'm approaching a painting like this and I'm painting from a reference, I'm honestly, as I ob observe it in the beginning, I'm gonna get a little bit more of my yellow ochre here. Um, I'm trying to, you know, think of the approach I would have to paint it, um, but also like what techniques would help me get it, kind of get certain types of looks. And so sometimes you just 
paint and look at your reference photo and then paint, add some more, look at the reference photo, you just go back and forth. And then on our right hand side here, again, these are the darkest. So I'm gonna kind of go all the way down and then maybe use a little bit of water to blend it into that last row. Clean water. Super loose. Feel like my brush is a little too wet. You can always, again, just at this point, we can go right into our paint and then onto our paper, but I do try to move a little bit of the excess. That was a little bit darker than I was hoping for. So again, just add some water and reuse some of that paint in other places. I want to make sure that that vertical line is also staying. So I'm going to kind of add that back in here. And your lines are going to get sharper as things get more dry. So we'll eventually be painting wet onto dry. Separating each kernel there. Going back over some of them as they dried, if they don't look dark enough. magic's really going to happen when we take off the masking fluid. Lisa Amport says she's um, following, but she's a little a step behind. What you're looking for with a painting is like, I think a lot of people stop before they're done, and it's because you got to add... You know we're painting light to dark and so as you add paint and dries and you're seeing what values you're ending up with you're always kind of you know going back to your reference and saying are my darks dark enough um, is there enough contrast so if you go back to your reference and you think well this is definitely not as dark as i see in my reference or i see more dark don't be afraid to go back in um you've might have heard other artists say, you know, paint what you see, not what you think what you see. <laughs> and um, really that just means, you know, paint what, paint the color that you see. You might think, oh, it looks a little bit weird. Um, but if you just paint what you see, you'll be surprised at um, how it turns out. Because there are darks here and the contrast is what's going to add realism and definition and make your painting really stand out. I lost some of the definition over here on this row. I'm gonna come back in there to add that. How are you doing, Lisa? next to my husk there. And again, it doesn't really look like corn yet. <laughs> a lot of paintings go through kind of a weird, awkward stage. Um, this one definitely does. I don't think it actually really looks like the corn until we take off that masking fluid. Um, just try to create as much definition as you can around each little kernel. Now I've got the Muse jar. If you've been following me, um, I've been pulling prompts from the Muse jar. We've got a 
a group chat in the Watercolor for Real Beginners Facebook group. Um, but I will be pulling something out of the Muse jar again very soon as a painting prompt. Here it is. My best friend actually gifted this to me for Christmas because I'm always calling her, I don't know what to paint, I don't know what to paint. So there's hundreds of ideas in here. I've been pulling them out. Um, trying to do it weekly, but that really hasn't. It's been probably a, every couple weeks now. Um, I'll be pulling one of those again, but also happy to take your ideas on um, different subjects you'd like to see me paint or learn how to paint. I'm happy to teach that. All right, so. I'm happy with where I'm at here. Um, we're gonna let this corn dry. I'm pretty much done with it. Um, but now we're gonna go back to our husk. So we've got that base color down. That's you know our, our uh, lightest color. Now we're gonna go in and start to just add some of these lines. So we're gonna do wet on dry. And in the line draw, excuse me, I didn't draw all the lines. I just drew a few of them to give you an idea of which way they would go and so with this you can um, be as free as you want but you can see that we've kind of got two sections of the husk we've got this section here that's kind of folded over um, and then the one behind it so we do want to paint them separately if we put wet paint here and then try to add put wet paint here they're going to blend with each other so we want to kind of section it off same thing on this side where you know we've got this leaf coming up here we're going to paint this first and then we'll paint this second those lines are going different ways so for this i'm going to start with my sap green um, and just add a bit of that to my palette grab a bigger brush to mix so sap green So I'm also going to use this, but I do want to have a little bit of a darker value. So I'm also going to grab a little bit of my hooker screen. I'm going to put it on the right hand side. You can see it's really dark. Let's mix it up. So we're getting kind of two values. Um, now the reason why I have that purple again is to darken up the screen because hooker screen really doesn't look very natural. It's a very kind of bright green, but if you add just the tiniest bit of deoxazine purple, it's going to look a little darker and it's gonna look more natural. So if I were to test these colors out for you, grab a scrap sheet of paper. You can see there is the hooker screen with, or sorry, a hooker screen light is the color I'm using. Here's what it looks like on its own, very unnatural. And again, just the tiniest bit of that dioxazine purple is going to give you a much more natural looking green. So mostly sap green on the left, that mixture on the right, we've just got like kind of a, a mix of washes here that's going to help us have add some variety as we go. All right, so back to my number four brush. Going right into the light side of this. And I'm just going to start by defining the edge on the top side of this husk so it starts down here hopefully you can see your your line drawing I seem to have lost mine a bit um, but I'm just gonna start by outlining here and if you use a vertical hold with your brush and a very light hold you should be able to get a nice thin line okay we're doing wet on dry here and we're also you know dry brush works really nice here as well um, now that we've got that section kind of defined we're gonna go and start adding in some of the lines so it also has like a little bit of lighter edge here so I'm going to kind of outline that at this point we're just following the direction of the lines that we drew and using if you use just the tip of your brush you should get some nice like wispy lines and he, we really want to add variety of color texture you've got all these kind of variegated lines in the corn husk so again it's not photorealistic it's just using different techniques to add this type of texture now that we've got like one color down we're going to go in for that darker green 
and do kind of the same thing again adding variety we'll do probably another layer on that too um, let's let that side dry and we'll go ahead and do the same thing to the other side again starting with that kind of sap green and then defining first Lisa Bryant says it's messy lol <laughs> It is messy and honestly that's one of the things I struggle with like I think everybody that's like wants to try watercolor you see these loose florals these like paintings that look so effortlessly loose <laughs> and I have I struggle to paint that way it's a lot harder than it looks um, and maybe it's because it's probably a lot simpler than it is than we make it but uh, I've learned that when I am a little less conscious about being perfect that I end up with some really cool stuff um, and you see I'm even using a little bit of dry brush technique here where my brush isn't very wet but I'm getting like the texture of the paper shining through because I'm just kind of going quickly and getting that nice texture we we'll use a smaller brush to get even more detailed lines in a little bit I'm now going in with the darker so this video will be posted after we're done with the live yeah, so uh, it'll take probably about 24 hours for the video to process once the live is over, but you will be able to rewatch it on uh, my YouTube channel, and I'll make sure that I post a link to, a, um, to it as well in the, the Facebook group so that nobody misses out. If you only make it so far through the tutorial and want to come back, or maybe you're just kind of watching along today and want to give it a try um, on your own time, it should be available um, hopefully by this time tomorrow. And back over now that this other side's starting to dry, just again, layering in these these brush marks pretty randomly, just giving this texture of corn. And so as those start to dry, we'll we'll do the bottom part. I think for right now we can now go to the stem. So with the stem, you kind of have like the screen part and these lighter areas. I didn't really leave my lighter areas. <laughs> you can either just kind of leave it as is and, and try to go with the darker, or you can try to lift. Um, the way that you lift watercolor, I've rinsed off this brush and now it's damp. You know, watercolor can be reactivated. So I see this line here. If I take and just lay some water there, and I'm gonna agitate it a little bit with the tip of my brush, and do it down here as well. And then I see a little bit right here at the base. Again, you don't want to have too much water, but just agitate a little bit. And once you've kind of reactivated that watercolor, take your paper towel, blot it. Voila, we have our highlights back. <laughs> um, a lot of people say, you know, it's difficult to paint with watercolor because it, it you can't really do much once you lay it down. But um, I always say like as long as it's wet you can mostly lift it but even if it's after it's dried if you use the right techniques you can lift that so we're gonna do the same thing here that we did up top and just add uh, those lines kind of on the stock you can define those lighter areas with an outline if you'd like just going for texture the stem is a uh, one of the least important parts of the subject here but it wouldn't be corn without a stem right I went over my line a little bit I'm just gonna blot that again the watercolor will only go where the water is so if I dry it while I blot it won't bleed okay. we're almost there all right so now we're gonna go back into the bottom we've got you know our lines going a little bit different direction here but we're doing the same technique Remember, we've got our, our sap green, and then our darker is the, the hooker's green, mixed with the tiniest amount of dioxazine purple. Kind of neutralize it a little bit. There we go. I do like to, to kind of outline when I'm doing this step. Um, 
It just gives a little bit more structure. Then you would kind of have a little bit of a shadow on these bottom parts. They're going to be, I'm going to make them a little bit darker just where um, it's folding over to kind of insinuate that is happening. But following the lines that you drew, going back in with that darker color for another layer. You could stop here. I think I'm gonna grab my detail brush. This is a, I was just using a four. I'm gonna go back to my zero. And this is the same one I was using in between the current kernels. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab that dark green and just add in a few more lines. The more variation you have here um, between darks and lights and different colors, the more realistic this is going to appear. Just some little detail lines here and there to add some variety and interest. And I will make sure to, to find that edge between where this kind of folds over. So that's pretty clear. With a tiny brush like this, you do have to reload it a lot. Probably get just two or three good brush strokes before you have to reload it. Okay. I'm pretty happy with that. So the last step now is um, to make sure everything's dry before we move this masking fluid. Um, again, be careful with your heat tool because we don't want it to remove the masking fluid, but I'm gonna try to just kind of give mine one last little spritz of hot air to dry it up. I'm gonna look just quickly over this to make sure all my detailed lines got dry without heating up that masking fluid too much. Once you're confident everything is dry, it's time to remove our masking fluid. This is like my favorite part. I'm like getting excited now. Um, you can remove this just by rubbing it with your finger. Be careful if you have, you know, want to have clean hands so you don't get oil on the painting um, from your hands. Or if you have a rubber cement pickup like this, it's just kind of like a weird eraser feeling thing, but it, it uh, will grab that masking fluid pretty easily and makes it quick and, and simple to remove. And as it's peeling it off, I do have to kind of remove it from here. And this should be the step where your corn starts to come alive. These little highlights, I think just make it look so much more detailed and realistic and looks like you spent hours just painting each little kernel, but little do you People know we did it pretty quickly thanks to our masking fluid. If your corn looked weird, it should start to look a lot more like corn at this step. Almost there. This tool really is super helpful. And I didn't use I tried masking fluid a few times. I think it failed for me. And then I really had to, you know, I use it when it makes sense. I don't use it all the time, but how cool is that? That added all those little uh, highlights, each of those corn kernels, and now this looks like pretty realistic. Um, at this point you could be done. If there are any areas where you didn't like what happened with your masking fluid, you can always go and add a little bit more color somewhere if you like, but I'm pretty happy with this. So now we remove our tape, get my paint palette out of the way. And again, I mentioned 
a trick for removing your tape without ripping your paper is to heat it up a little bit. So I'll go ahead and do that. Are you going to sign it? That's always the last step. I will do that once I remove it from the, you know, I'll show you. I promise I don't get paid by anybody to push any products. I'm just like sharing the things that I love to use. But one of, I think, my most favorite items is this glass dip pen that I use for signing my artwork. Um, I do sign it with watercolor. Uh, depending on who you talk to, some watercolor artists will say, you know, you can't sign it with anything other than watercolor and certain shows if you enter maybe are going to be strict like that. Honestly, it doesn't matter. If you want to use white wash, use white wash. If you want to sign it in ink, sign it in ink. I don't think it matters, but I do like the fact that I can use this dip pen to use ink or sign it with watercolor. So this most satisfying part is pulling off the tape and seeing that nice clean edge. This is my first time, honestly, using this Beohong, I think I'm saying that right, um, Academy Watercolor Paper Pad. Again, it's 100% um, cotton. This is really great. I tend to use uh, Paul Rubens as another option that's a little bit less expensive, but this worked out really well. I really seem to like this paper. All right, so now I'm going to remove it from my block before I sign it. So if you have a block, again, it's glued on all four, all four sides, but you should have just a little slit here um, where you can access the edge of the paper. And I'm going to grab a palette knife. You can use any type of flat object, and then you just move it all the way around, and it will separate the paper from the block. There we go. Now sign it. So I'm gonna take my, my dip pen. So this glass dip pen, um, you, know, you pretty much dip it in ink and it, and it will work. When you use it with watercolor, you do need, do need to make sure that um, your watercolor is not too watered down or it won't really show up. So I think for this, I'll sign it maybe in green, the dark green we've been using. So to load this up, what I've learned is I'll take my paint on my palette and I'll just kind of paint it onto the top of the dip pen. And normally you would dip it into like ink. Um, you could use liquid watercolor and just dip it into that, but um, I really just want to load it up. Where did you find the dip pen? My husband got me one for Christmas. Um, I found, I, I almost find everything on Amazon, you guys. <laughs> um, just because it's super simple, but that's I think where I got these and I do kind of like just test it real quick because sometimes it'll drip but you can see how easy it is to throw my brushes around to write just like you would with a pen or pencil um, and you can use watercolor plus I also think that these are really pretty <laughs> it's kind of like one of the fanciest things that I own all right so now that I got that in there I'm gonna go ahead and sign There we go. You rinse off my, my little dip pen Can you here. sign on the left? It doesn't matter where you sign. Sometimes I sign on the right, sometimes the left. Sometimes I just create a little bit of balance. I had kind of an empty space here, so I thought it would be a, a good spot for my signature. Um, but there you have it, everyone. Watercolor corn. What do you think? I love it. Your deep green has a lot of blue in it. Oh, I bet that's pretty, um, especially next to the yellow. I like doing paintings that are like not natural colors, um, even though they might be a little bit more realistic. And so a green, a bluish green corn cob would be pretty cool. I'll show you some examples here. I don't know that this is very realistic as far as the colors, but I love it. <laughs> but this is one I, I did a tutorial and you can find the video where I'm painting this realistic um, flower. And after I was done the, the tutorial, I just kind of kept going and playing with color. And you know, sometimes it just, you need a little pop of color. So I would love a, a bluish green corn. <laughs> But there you have it, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I know we went quick. Um, if you'd like to have more of these live tutorials, 
uh, let me know. You know, we provided um, an outline, the color palette, uh, reference photos. Also, if you have any ideas of, of things that you would like to learn how to paint, I um, would love to show you how to do that. But check out my channel. There's hundreds of videos there to, to you know, be everything from project tutorials to talking about different supplies and um, just trying to answer as many questions as I can for other beginners so that they can have uh, a really great journey through watercolor. So thank you everyone. Uh, talk to you soon.